Hi, everybody. It's Margie Meacham. Welcome back to the Brain Matters podcast. Today, I'm here with Dr. Jane Bozarth. Jane holds um, a lot of degrees. She has a master's in education and training and development technology and a doctor in adult education. In addition, she's written several books on learning best practices, and she has served as a member of Training Magazine's book review team for 10 years. You can find her now in her own lovely column, Nuts and Bolts, which I've quoted frequently on my site and in my blog. And uh, she does that for the eLearning Guild's Learning Solutions Magazine. You can also find her live almost anytime on Twitter at Jane Bozarth and almost always on Thursday evenings as one of our moderators of the popular Learn Chat session, hashtag LRN Chat which is where I first met her online, although I'd been a fan of her books for years. So Jane's newest book is Show Your Work, The Payoffs and How-Tos of Working Out Loud, and it's full of practical insights for the learning professional and leverages the latest discoveries of how the brain works and why we learn better by showing with others. So Jane, how did you make the transition from an instructional designer to a noted author, speaker, and thought leader? Uh, I had worked in government for a number of years, and I had done lots and lots of really traditional things. I mean, I had done many, many rounds of new employee orientation and introduction to supervision, and we had bought a purchased, you know, off-the-shelf leadership development product that I was certified in and had delivered. And it, it just seemed like it was this endlessly spinning hamster in a wheel where we were just replicating old stuff that didn't necessarily work very well, and we all acknowledged that, but we weren't moving forward. So I started looking for ways that we could sort of break past traditional training. It wasn't completely useless. I just felt that we could do better. And and among the things that I saw opportunities for were to stop making people drive at the time um, several hundred miles and spend the night in hotels just to do things like new hire orientation, which was really basically forms and when when you get paid and how you do this and that sort of process in the organization. And so I got very interested in e-learning And from there, it sort of spun off into uh, ideas for better design, ideas for things that were not just courses, ideas for ways we could make things easier and more usable for our target audience. It seemed like we we often make our learners do an awful lot of work uh, that isn't necessarily related to anyone really learning anything. A lot of it was logistics, like I said, the driving, or a lot of it was, was inconvenient for them. So figuring out ways of doing things a little better, I think, mattered. Um, I had worked around a lot of, and still do, a, a lot of people who came to training through a a back door. You know, they had been a presenter somewhere or they were a subject matter expert in a particular field, and suddenly they were charged with designing and developing and delivering training, and they had very little theoretical underpinning for that. I mean, I think there was a sense of I know what an engaging, funny presentation is. I don't know that I know very much about which things actually help someone learn and which things are just fluff and which things may even harm the learning. So I got interested in the more academic, theoretical, research-based, evidence-based side of things uh, along the way. And I was very fortunate that I um, am located, my office is is literally within sight of uh, North Carolina State University, which has a master's in uh, technology and training, or did at the time, I think they've changed the name, but it's technology and training, and also a doctorate in human resource development and and training and development. So I I had a lot of easy access to opportunities, and I could have done most of that online, but it it didn't hurt that it was right there kind of in my face. Yeah, it sounds like you took the most of your opportunities. Yeah. And I have a feeling that a lot of our listeners have gone through a similar yeah. level of frustration. Yeah. We've, we've recognized those patterns. And um, and maybe some folks have also uh, come to the learning professional space, just like you described. We're kind of accidental trainers, and now we're trying to figure out what works right. and why it works. Right. So we're, we're kind of all in that boat. So, right. I think so. And and I um, – excuse me. I um, yeah. I had another thought, and it that's okay. Yeah, go for <laughs> and it. it. It ran away with me, and now I can't. I can't. I can't. Oh, and I, you know, I was an English major. I was always dabbling in writing, and I was really interested in publishing. Back in a time, you know, before we had blogs and wikis and lots of online publishing opportunities, there weren't a million people writing about kind of the same topics. And so I guess I got my foot in the door kind of early with that, especially with Training Magazine. I was writing columns and opinion pieces for them very early on. 
Uh, and, and as technologies evolved and I worked for government, we never had a budget, I was always looking for ways to leverage cheap things or do things without very much money. And it, it, that's how it kind of evolved into me writing in that direction to start with. I mean, my writing has sort of spun off to other things, but I would say that's, that's kind of where that got started. Yeah, and I think one of the first uh, uh, places where I became aware of you was um, how you were calling attention to all the great things you can do just with PowerPoint and other mm-hmm. cheap and mm-hmm. free tools. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, that's a perfect example of what mm-hmm. you've been doing. Mm-hmm. So tell me, while now that we're talking about publishing, what motivated you to write your latest book, Show Your Work? Well, my dissertation uh, was actually on communities of practice and about how we can better capture tacit knowledge. It's always been a struggle in organizations. You, you know, they, they want everyone to write everything down, and they want to have meetings where we talk about activities. And they have this, this sort of Tayloristic, industrialized view that if we can just capture everything someone knows and get it into a database, then we can sort it and extract it back out in the pieces we need. And it, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, that, is, that just isn't how you transfer knowledge around an organization. You may be able to capture what a person does, but that doesn't necessarily capture how they get things done, right, which can be a, sort of a, a, a gut-level um, understanding over, over time of how you manage an exception, what relationships you need to groom, who else you need to know to get something accomplished, what the reality is versus what it says on the paper. Uh, and so I have always had kind of an abiding interest in that. And one of the things I learned in my, in my dissertation work, I had worked with, actually my unit of interest was a community of trainers. And one of the things that they focused on was how we pass good practice to sort of the next generation or to the newer ones, like we talked about just a few minutes ago, these people who are, are coming to training rather informally. Uh, and, and, you know, the way we were capturing that knowledge and the way that was being shared was not through formal documentation necessarily. So I, I've always been interested in it, and there was a lot of literature associated with it even then. I think that people are of the uh, impression that this is somehow new, but really John Seeley Brown and mm-hmm. Dean Lave and, and Etienne Winger were writing about this long before any talk about working out loud or showing your work or any of that. Uh, and in fact, John, John Seeley Brown and Paul DeGuid re- reference understanding an organizational map, that you can't navigate an organization without familiar landmarks. And without a good map, a person is much less likely to succeed. And I think that's a more useful way of maybe looking at uh, showing work and, and sharing tacit knowledge than just documenting everything in, in a ledger or in a database. Okay, great. Well, then, um, and uh, I'm going to see if I can't dig up uh, some links unless you have them on the uh, references that you just made there, Jane, so that we can give those to our listeners as well. Oh, sure. Sure, I can get, okay. I can get those too. Great. Okay. So then um, some people might, when they first hear it, show my work, they might feel a little uncomfortable sharing something that's a work in progress because in their eyes, it's not finished yet. And so what would you tell them? What are some of those payoffs for taking that risk? There are lots of ways to show work is one of the first things I'll say. It may just be sitting in a meeting saying, I've been working on this and I keep running into this obstacle or I've been working on this and these are some things I've learned as I'm going right it may it may not be just throwing something out there for the whole world to view that's that's unfinished but I would say in terms of sharing something that's in say a draft form or or it's sort of in a and you're working you're still chewing on it form there there's several things first of all other people can have a chance to chime in and may be able to save you a lot of time and trouble I think one of the advantages of showing your work is if we do it well, it means we don't all have to learn everything the hard way. We don't Mm -hmm. all have to learn everything from scratch all the time. I mean, I think we've all had the experience of finishing something and then finding out somebody down the hall had already done it, or we struggle to learn, I don't know, a new tool or new software, a new approach, and then we find out somebody in another building has a degree in that and would have been happy to help. So I think Letting things go out a little bit before they're fully formed is a great way to get formative feedback to save you trouble or to save you, uh, save you extra work or to, or to maybe make the end product better. Uh, it lets, and I think this is, this is important and we lose sight of it a lot. I think that the people around us, maybe bosses, maybe customers, maybe other people in our world, they don't understand how 
difficult or easy a certain kind of work is. For instance, I had a really popular online simulation. I built a, a, a customer service thing several years ago, and one of our managers came to me and said, can you build me one of those things with those characters, and they're animated, and they talk, and that was kind of fun, and can you do it about my topic? And I said, well, yeah, but it would probably take me you know, a month or six weeks. And they were just stunned. <laughs> that I couldn't crank that out by Tuesday. <laughs> right? Yeah. right. So I think showing your work as you're going and showing things in development, and this is what the draft is like, and this is what we're at the halfway point, it helps other people around you understand the scope of what they're doing. Now, sometimes people ask me for something, and it really does take me a minute. I mean, it really, it, you know, there's some things I do, for instance, something with PowerPoint, it would take me five minutes to do where they'd have to sit and learn, you know, how to create a particular kind of animation and spend three days on some maddening little timing thing that I could do in my sleep. So, so I think understanding what each other does all day and, and what kind of uh, effort is involved and, and how the, the workflow works is really important. So that's the second thing. So let's see, I've said it's helping uh, other people understand what we do and showing them kind of the scale and the scope of it. It's helping uh, maybe get feedback as you're going. But the, the third thing, and you mentioned this as you were introducing me. I don't, I, I don't remember exactly where it fell, but it was early on. The literature tells us there's a nice study out of Vanderbilt, for instance, that tells us that when we articulate our work, we learn from that. When we articulate our decisions, when we can say, this is where I am, and this is what I'm doing, and this is what I'm thinking about, and this is how I'm thinking of continuing, when we, when we explain that to other people, when we put it in writing, or when we make a video, or when we capture it in a conversation, we learn from that. It helps us improve what we're doing. And I think we all know that. When you sit down and start writing down what you're working on or trying to write out a justification, you realize that things are maybe more involved than you thought or you, or you think, gee, there's something I didn't think of. So it sort of forces a reflection at that point that, again, can, can create a better end product and can save us time and effort along the way. And, and really, there are things that a lot of us do. You know, we haven't said anything yet about who you share what with. There may be things you only share with your boss. There may be things you don't tell anybody. There may be things you share with your immediate work team. There may be something you put on Twitter or on a blog or, or write about in, in a, a magazine piece. You know, and in that way, we can help develop the industry. And helping other practitioners see how you work can be very useful. I mean, going back to our whole conversation about how so many people in our field uh, came to it without formal training. We, showing them things as they're happening can be enormously useful to, to helping sort of develop practice. It's good for our community. Um, Atul Gawande made a comment one time. Uh, I think the line was, you know, writing states your intention to be a member of the community. And I think that that's, that's important if we want to improve our field, which we all say we do. That's one way we can do it. Okay, great. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more practical ideas yeah. and suggestions yeah. in your book. So without well, giving well, you think, the whole book. Oh, can I do it again? Can I yes. interrupt you again? I'm sorry. You I, bet. One, one thing, one thing I, I didn't mention that I think is important, especially for newer people or for people who are maybe freelancers or they are not in an organization with a lot of technical support. I mean, I work in a situation where we don't have an army of graphic designers. I don't have any software I need at any moment. We have to sometimes work with what we have. I think it's very useful to show people it doesn't have to be a, a finished, polished Star Wars movie, right? It can just be something that you're mm -hmm. cranking out. And I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for showing how to manage with what you've got, for showing things that maybe aren't the, the final, um, you know, the the – apex of the possibilities very few of us are going to be in that kind of shop i mean i envy you if you are but many of us won't be and so seeing things uh, as we manage them and figure them out i think is really important oh yeah i i agree with all of that um so uh let's say we've got somebody listening and they really haven't done much of that of sharing before mm -hmm. and they get it how do they get started what give us maybe three tips for getting started well let me and let me just say again you know Think about who you're sharing what with and why. Again, there may be something you only share with your boss. There may be something you share with your division. There may be something you can share with the world. I would, I would of course, obey my organizational communication policies, especially if you're working on financials or something about you know, patent research or, or, or something like that. I would be thoughtful about what I shared where. But I think uh, taking a screenshot when you're in the middle of something, I remember um, – 
one day I had been working forever with this just enormous pile of material from one of our subject matter experts. It was just pages and pages of some process. And I finally was able to boil, basically boil it down to five points, and I just did a side-by-side -side view and a screenshot and tweeted it out, and it was really popular. It's like this is what we need to be able to show management. This is, what we, this is how you get to your critical information. So showing, showing a side-by-side -side comparison, and that was to Twitter, to a group. I am largely followed by people in L&D. I, I have a lot of followers who are in ID, and that, that kind of thing was very useful for them. Um, one time, and this was on the advice of a friend of mine who at the time was at Yammer, she said that sometimes uh, late in the day when everybody was cranky and tired, she would just she would just uh, post something on Yammer that said, quick, everybody tell me what you're working on right this second. And I tried that one day here at the office, and, like late on a Tuesday when we were all tired. It was 3.30 or 4 o'clock or something. And it turned out of nine of us in the building, five of us, we're essentially responding to the same question from the same client. Oh. And and who had called up and down the hallway till somebody mm -hmm. picked up the phone and, and asking to get the, the answer she wanted. That would never have come out in a staff meeting. It's not going to come out in an activity report, right? It's the kind of thing that gives you a really nice snapshot of everybody's day. So just what are you working on right now? I think I think my best tip for this is to look at, traditional things you're doing and how we could make them more useful. I think everybody agrees that staff meetings aren't very useful, that, that weekly TPS reports are not very useful. I mean, we make movies about how ridiculous they are, and then we keep doing them. Uh, I, I would say, um, for one thing, ask a different question. For years, in a previous administration, we had a manager who liked these weekly reports, and one of the line items was uh, research. And people would put in some website they visited or some book they were reading or something. And I got them to change that question to, what did you learn this week? Mm. And that reframed how people thought about what they were doing, and it caused them to state more of an outcome. I, I wasn't just lurking around on a bunch of sites. This is what, what a goal was, or this is what I got out of it. When you talk about the staff meetings, instead of just listing reports, Ask that question, what did you learn this week? What obstacles did you encounter this week? What was the hardest thing about that? How did you learn to do that? Can you show me how to do that? Right? You know, asking different, better questions within the same old paradigms may be the, may be the answer to that. So taking a screenshot, tweeting something out, mentioning a, a different way in a, in a meeting, um, take a picture of it if you fix it. I have a screen at the end of a lot. I do a lot of webinars because we have such a distributed workforce. We have a, a lot of people scattered around, and travel is always an issue for state employees. And at the end of a lot of them, I have kind of a smile sheet thing. It's just a screen, and it, it's called a geometric close, and it asks people to, to choose a quadrant on the screen and to say something that, for instance, something that completed a circle of knowledge or something that squared with them that they agreed with that confirmed or affirmed something they believed. Uh, there's, there's, you know, what, what change are you going to make because of this? And, and I think there's a circle, square, rectangle. I don't remember. There's four. And people, people will write more useful things for me than you would get from them checking a three or a four on a smile sheet survey, right? Mm -hmm. They'll say something that they're taking away. They'll say something that re resonated with them. They'll say something they plan to try. And um, one day I took a screenshot of that and I took a, you know, in Snagit, I just took the marker and blocked out their last names because in WebEx you can drop little arrows right. down. It shows people and I, I dropped that into a weekly report and management kind of flipped out. <laughs> they, didn't really know what to, they didn't really know what to do because nobody had ever put a picture in a weekly report before. And they liked it, but they didn't, they didn't quite know what to make of it. But it gave a much better picture of what Jane was doing, of what happened in Jane's class, of who was in Jane's class about the attitude of the people in Jane's class. You see what I mean? It was really yeah. much more useful information. Um, and then I used it for marketing. I tweeted it out because we have, you know, we allow public at my, at my experiences. We, we dropped it into our internal communications. So that was a great way of showing my work that was just, it was just something I was already doing anyway. I just took a screenshot. The only work I had to do was take their last names off. Yeah. which they wouldn't have cared about if I was just using it internally. It was when I decided to tweet it I needed to get that. So, so you know, just look at what you're doing. I, I think one of the more critical issues with showing your work is that we're not trying to impose more work. We're trying to help you extract <laughs> usefulness from the work you're already doing. So take a screenshot, take a picture, um, add a note to a weekly report, um, make, mention at a staff meeting. We aren't asking that people drop everything for an hour at the end of every day and write some gut-wrenching reflection of everything they worked on. 
Right. Okay, great. You know what? And that question that you mentioned brings me to my next line of thought I wanted to talk to you about. That what have you learned this week? Well, that's how our Learn Chat community starts out on Twitter. And I think that's um, where I got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably well, where I got it. Yeah. You started it, um, you and probably a few other colleagues, um, a while ago when, you know, now there's like dozens of uh, um, chats that are related to our profession and other professions. But how did that all get started? Well, actually, I wasn't a founder. Um, that I would say that the primary credit goes to Marsha Connor, who had written with Tony Bingham, had written the new social learning that came out a few years back. I would okay. say she started Learn Chat. I think Clark Quinn was involved early on, and I don't know for sure who else then. Um, and people have come and gone over the year. I mean, it's a big commitment. It's once a week, and it's every Thursday night. And people, some some people we lose because they have children whose bedtime coincides for a few years, and they go away, and then they come back. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, but but I think Marsha, uh, Twitter was fairly new. I think the idea of Twitter chats were new, and Marsha and Clark and, and others were interested in how we could facilitate a um, you know an ongoing conversation about social learning and the things that interested us. Because one of the problems is that people, to a point I made earlier, tended to respond to the idea of social learning as if it was something new. It's nothing new. It's how we learn all the time and always have. Yeah, thank uh, you for saying people, that. Yeah, but people people were somehow uh, responding to it as if it wasn't. And here we had this great, easy tool to use. Uh, a few things I would say lessons learned. Now, when Marsha set this up, it's set up for Thursday nights at 8.30, which is great if you're in the United States, but it pretty much excludes everybody in Europe and England and the U.K. It's the middle of the night there. So it's very hard with a Twitter chat to pick a time of day that really accommodates everyone. So we have 8.30 in the evening, East Coast time, which is great for Australians because it's like 10.30 their time, but we're cutting out England, <laughs> the UK, and, and Europe. So so I think some other chats sprang up um, to, to help accommodate that. For a time, you probably don't remember, we did learn chat twice a day. We had an early learn chat. Oh, that was before and, my time. Yeah, and it was it was exhausting. Um, I don't know that, that, and I was part of that. I was around when we when we created that. So we were doing one. I was doing one. Uh, we were doing it like ten or eleven o'clock on Thursday mornings, and then we would repeat the questions at night. And there were a number of issues with that. But Jane Hart uh, in England helped with that a whole lot uh, back in the day. We had people who came to both of them, and, you know, we'd already had the conversation with them once, and so that was a challenge, and it was just tiring, and it tended to be the same people over and over, and um, a lot of times the people who were awake early on Thursdays ended up being the ones almost always working on the questions, and so eventually we we cut that one and just decided to keep the evening, and some other people, uh, you know, across time have, have stepped up and started other other chats. So there's a, there's another one that's a you know other times of day um, to to help accommodate the whole population. So um, you know one of the things about Learn Chat that I'm kind of adamant about, and this is why we have moderators with different opinions. I I spend all of my time my work time is with classroom trainers. I am the only person here who really develops a lot of online stuff. They use it, and, and they'll work on it with me, but they are primarily doing a lot of leadership stuff. They do a lot of, of equal employment opportunity kinds of stuff. So I am not really interested in my free time on, on an evening to talk about whether we should use Sharpie markers or Mr. Sketch markers or, <laughs> or <laughs> you know whether we should do icebreakers or not. I, I mean, I think that's fine, but I'm not very interested in trainer chat. I think other chats do work on that, and that's why we have different strokes for different folks, right? So so we try very hard to keep Learn Chat trained on learning and not so much you know, delivering instruction. We we aren't always successful, but we do try. Yeah, and I, uh, I heartily recommend it. I often um, tweet about it, mention it in my blogs. I definitely recommend right. it to fellow learning professionals. It's a fun community. I'm kind mm-hmm. of embarrassed to say my reason for missing uh, missing it a lot of times at that 8.30 p.m. Eastern is I'm on a golf course after yeah. work yeah. as many days as I can be, and that's at about 5. This time of year, it's 5.30 in Arizona. Right. So, right. Well, um, yeah. yeah. Well, and the Californians will say they're caught in traffic. You know, it's rush hour for them. You, you, you know what? You can't win. I mean, we've learned that with, with Che. You can't, you can't be a, have a twenty-four hour presence. And so, you know, there are some chats now. There's an Ed chat for teachers that I think actually still runs all the time. 
I don't. Yes, think I've seen have, it. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it goes all the time. So it's a it's a fun community. You know, the other night, Allison Michaels has been very busy. She started a new job, and then she had a baby, and um, she finally she showed up again the other night after quite a while, and. and you know, everybody said, where's the baby? We want a picture. And that's kind of a sign you have a community of people who know each other, who like each other. And so we had the, um, I don't know if you saw it, the Learn Chat Babies hashtag popped up for a little while. <laughs> so, you know, there's Learn Chat Babies, there's Learn Chat Dogs. Uh, you know, we're very proud of the community. There are a lot of people there who, who you know, we know each other by name. We recognize each other at conferences. People do know who whose dad just died or who has a, had a baby or who's, um, a musician or who's been you know working on another degree and I think that's really important to sustaining a community and we have a lot of people who just see the hashtag and they drop in and out but but I think I can say we we know a, a lot of folks who've made pretty tight connections uh, through learn chat and I I have a number of really good friends Jeanette Campos and I are delivering keynotes together and we met through learn chat years ago so Okay, well, and that's a perfect definition of a true, as you said, a true yeah. community. Yeah. So let's close with um, what you're working on right now. What's really got you excited? I have a uh, a bunch of interesting stuff coming up this fall. I've got trips on the way uh, all around Show Your Work. I've got trips on the way to uh, London and Glasgow week after next, and then I'm headed uh, back to across the pond to uh, Online Educa Berlin later this fall, and it's all more of a hands-on workshop approach to showing your work, and I'm excited about that. I kind of sort of piloted it when I was doing an event at Penn State uh, earlier this summer, and I've made some tweaks to it, so I'm really excited to take it back out. It's, it's less theory and more hands-on. Uh, for a long time, I was just sort of introducing the idea of show your work, and now people want to really work with it and practice, you know, work with ideas around their own stuff. I'm doing... Um, a collaborative workshop in Chicago with Andy Hughes. He's going to do, uh, we're doing sort of half on gamification and half on social uses, uh, use of social tools to expand training and development to expand uh, learner opportunities. Uh, and I'm, I'm very interested. I see a hole in our business uh, around uh, issues around accessibility. So I've been doing a lot more uh, with that, not just specific to e-learning, but to usability and, and accessibility in general. And I guess that harks back a bit to where we started this conversation when I was saying I was trying to figure out how to make things easier for our learners. We seem to make things very hard for them sometimes, mm -hmm. and so I'm working on that. I had a dad who had some vision issues. I have a husband who many people who will hear this podcast remember he had brain surgery a couple of years ago, and it's very eye-opening to see somebody who was suddenly kind of struggling with some vision issues, with some hearing issues, and how simple things in your day could be made much less challenging if we just paid more attention. So I'm doing a good deal of work with that. I'll be talking about that at DevLearn. And also there's been, there's been kind of a renewed interest in communities and communities of practice in our field and how they really work. Uh, I, I see a lot of people for lack of a better word, organizing themselves into what I would call silos. They create these, these sort of private clubby groups, and they become echo chambers. They become sort of, they just sit around reinforcing each other's often bad practice. And so there's been some interest in, in looking at, and this was my dissertation topic, the dynamics of what makes a, a successful community of practice, what goes on internally, how permeable the walls ought to be. And so I'm going to be doing a research-based piece on that at DevLearn this year. So lots of lots of stuff cooking right now. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. So how can yeah. someone get in touch with you if they want to follow up on some of those things? I am always on Twitter at, at Jane Bozarth. Uh, that's probably the quickest way to get a hold of me and say I'm looking for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, my website is bozarthzone.com. Uh, it'll link you to my blog, and you can reach me from there. Um, also, my phone number is on my Twitter profile. Okay, fabulous. Jane, it has been a pleasure and an honor yep. to spend this much time with you. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for sharing your sure. ideas with our group here. And sure. um, we hope maybe we'll have you come back again because you're always doing something new. So yep. uh, let's think about that. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jane. Thank Thanks you, Margie. Bye. Bye-bye.